Okay, and welcome to my talk about the Secure VM uh, Service Module and Ingest Paravisor in Rust. So this is these are a lot of words. So let's track them down a little bit. What is SVSM? SVSM is, as I said, the Secure VM Service Module. It's a software which runs um, under AMD virtualization, specifically under um, AMD Secure Encrypted Virtualization. So it, it actually relies on uh, secure encrypted virtualization features. Um, it runs in guest context, which is uh, important as we will uh, see later. But it is isolated from the guest operating system. So the guest operating system cannot interfere with the memory of um, the SVSM or interfere with its execution. How this works, we will see later. Um, and the task or, or, or the main task of the SVSM is to provide services to a secure guest OS, um, like for example, emulating a TPM. As we have seen in the previous talk, TPM, TPMs play, uh, play a vital role in uh, full disk encryption and measured boot. And it's pretty important to have one in a um, encrypted virtualization environment. Um, to better understand the SVSM, uh, I will uh, shortly give an introduction into uh, SCV so that we are all on the same page. Um, SCV, as I said, is secure encrypted virtualization and it consists of three building blocks. It uses um, the AMD hardware virtualization features and adds to that memory encryption for the guest operating system, which is a plain SCV. Uh, on, on top of that, it provides um, encrypted state, which is encryption of register states. Uh, of the guest uh, CPUs, guest vCPUs. And on top of that, it also provides secure nested paging, which um, protects from even more attacks. Um, what is all this uh, good for? Um, this is good for reducing uh, our trusted execution base. So with, uh, with normal virtualization, we have this normal stack. We have the guest OS, hypervisor, and hardware. And if we are the guest owner, and we don't use SEV or any other confidential com confidential computing technology. We have to trust everything. We have to trust. We have to trust the guest OS. We have to trust the hypervisor, and we have to trust the hardware. If we use secure encrypted virtualization, we can go to confidential uh, computing and remove actually the host OS or hypervisor from the trusted execution base. So we don't trust the hypervisor anymore or the host OS. Which is important because um, you not always uh, the guest OS owner has control over the hypervisor which is running on. Best example here are the cloud providers where the cloud provider um, can offer the hypervisor and configure the hypervisor and control the hypervisor and you control the guest OS, but you basically have no way to uh, trust the hypervisor. With confidential computing, you don't need to trust because yeah, you can encrypt. Um, the state of your operating system. So let's dive into SCV, memory encryption. Um, if, you, if you are running a guest which has um, uh, secret data in it, like, th like this uh, VM processes credit card information, then without encryption, the, the guest, the hypervisor can basically see all your memory and steal data from it. it the guest OS owner will not even notice it. so. It can silently steer data out of the guest VM when it's not encrypted. This is what memory encryption protects against. With memory encryption, uh, we can basically turn the guest, to, the guest OS memory image into a black box. The hypervisor will only see the encrypted uh, data and cannot make any sense of it. Um, and it cannot steal any data, which is the most important um, item. As you can see here, there are still some memory areas which are not um, encrypted, but which areas this are and how big they are is fully under control of uh, the guest operating system. And these memory areas are needed for communication of the guest OS with the hypervisor. For example, for DMA bounce buffers or other uh, shared data structures. So this is, this is what uh, plain SCV provides. Building on that, there's state encryption. As I said, this encrypts uh, the CPU register state so that it becomes invisible to the hypervisor. 
the hypervisor cannot uh, read uh, the guest register state and more importantly it can also not make any modifications uh, to the guest register state anymore which is kind of problematic because um, without this without this access the hypervisor cannot handle all requests anymore for for, for certain intercepts for certain instruction intercepts like read msr for example or cpu id the hypervisor needs to access uh, the guest register state to actually get the instruction parameters and to write back the uh, results uh, of the instruction emulation this is not possible anymore when uh, cpu state is encrypted which means that now uh, when the state is encrypted the requests need to be partially handled inside uh, the guest especially the parts that change and read uh, the register state and on amd scv es and um, basically all all other um, hardware extensions i know this i know this is implemented via a new exception vector on amd this is the vc exception or vector 29 which is which is a vector which is invoked inside the guest when when usually an intercept would happen so if the guest executes a read msr instruction which is intercepted the hypervisor will not see that intercept anymore it will, but the guest will get a vc exception in that vc exception handler the the guest um, does the instruction decoding and and the communication with the hypervisor to fulfill uh, the exception for example for for read msr it gets the msr value from from the hypervisor and writes it back to the register state this is all happening inside the guest now and not any, anymore in the hypervisor here's a here's a um, picture of how this uh, works or with a under a normal um Normal guest and a not encrypted guest with, with with no state encryption. When the guest OS um, has a CPU ID instruction in its execution flow, then this will cause an intercept to the hypervisor. The hypervisor will decode the instruction. The hypervisor will get the data from its internal data structures. The hypervisor will update the state of the um, of the vCPU and give control back to the guest OS, which continues in its execution stream. As I said, with encrypted state, this does no longer work. So certain parts that happen on the hypervisor here will move into the guest. First of all, instruction decoding needs to happen inside the guest. And the state update need, needs to happen inside the guest. The get data part cannot move into the guest, at least not for all instructions. So to get the data, the guest now needs to call the hypervisor. The parts that are now moved from the host from the hypervisor into the guest um, all happen in the exception handler, which I mentioned, the VC exception handler. So this is a pattern you will uh, further encounter during this talk that functionality moves from the host hypervisor into the guest. Um, next item on the on the SCV. Um, chain is um, SCV secure nested paging and, SC and secure nested paging protects against memory attacks um, to protect the encrypted data. For example, the hypervisor could replay pre previously encrypted data. It could uh, read encrypted pages and replay the data later so that the guest will see old contents of the memory, which um, can be used to influence the guest's instruction uh, control flow and um, ultimately leak data from, uh, out of the guest. Or the hypervisor could, uh, in a similar way, remap encrypted pages. So it can um, remap encrypted pages from one guest physical address to another one to uh, basically achieve the same, pick the guest into leaking its uh, data. But with secure nested paging, the hardware provides protection against this. Um, this is implemented via a page state, so each 4K um, page in the in the system gets assigned a, a, unique, a unique state and that state is uh, saved in a new in-memory data structure called the RMP table
How does this work? Here is a simplified uh, state diagram of, um, of, of each page uh, on a secure nested paging system. So initially, all pages are host or hypervisor pages, which means that the hypervisor or host can read and write them and can wrap them to guests, but guests, guests can only read that page or write to that page when it maps it unencrypted. When the guest maps su such a page encrypted, it will get uh, an exception. So it cannot use a host or hypervisor page to store um, secret data. If the hypervisor wants to give that page to a guest for use um, as an encrypted page, it has to call R the RMP update instruction, which is a new instruction with uh, secure nested paging. It should change the state of the page to be a guest invalid uh, page. When the page is guest invalid, the hypervisor can, read the can still read the page, but cannot write to the page anymore. If it tries to write to the page, it will get a page fault. Um, the guest can actually map that page encrypted now but it cannot access the page yet because it's guest invalid and not guest valid. To make the page guest valid, um, the guest needs to execute another instruction called the p-validate instruction to change the state from guest invalid to guest valid. When the page is guest valid, the um, hypervisor can still not uh, write to that page and we get an exception, but now the guest can map the page encrypted. It actually has to map the page encrypted. If it maps a guest valid page unencrypted, it will also get an exception. So this page can now be used to store encrypted data. Um, so hypervisor can at any time take the uh, page back, calling RMP update, making it a host or hypervisor page again. But the important part here is that the that the guest uh, that the hypervisor cannot uh, bring a page directly from host into guest valid mode. This is what prevents uh, the attacks, because. Um, Every attack that the, the hypervisor uh, would try would require uh, some write to the page. And that's not that's only possible when the page is a, is a host or hypervisor page. And if, so if it wants to take the guess, it has to change the page from guest valid to, to hypervisor, do its changes, and then put it back into guest valid state, which is not possible. It can only put it back into guest invalid state. Now, if, if the guest believes a page should be valid while it is actually invalid, it will not. It will recognize this by getting an exception. And now, the now the guest knows something is wrong because the page is well, should be valid but is invalid. Some someone is um, fiddling with that page. Uh, do something about it. Either poison the page or uh, panic the kernel. Um, that are basically the options currently under under discussion. Uh, and with this state, with these states, the 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 attacks against um, the guest memory are, are basically mitigated. But this also has some some implications, uh, namely that the guest needs to track page states, because I already said it. The guest need the guest needs uh, needs to know whether a page is valid or invalid. It needs to track this information separately. Um, because when it when it receives an, an 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 exception on an invalid page access, it needs to know whether the page should be valid or not. This is required to to detect uh, these kinds of uh, hypervisor attacks. And another issue that um, is mitigated uh, by the by the page state tracking on in uh, in software is to avoid double validation. Double validation is actually very um, dangerous uh, on AMD on SCV SNP because um, on SCV SNP it opens an attack vector. If you do double validation, it, it could happen that you that you actually validate two different pages for your for your same guest physical address and the hypervisor can change the mapping between these two pages. Uh, without the guest notifying it. So because both pages are valid for the same guest physical address, the hypervisor can just change the pages and the guest will not, um, not um, has, has no way of, of detecting this. So this is how uh, SCV, up to SCV secure nested paging works. Now let's get to the main topic of the talk, um, which is implementing a secure VM service module.
to understand uh, a secure virtual uh, an SVSM, we, we also need to uh, understand another feature of uh, SCB SMP, which is VM privilege levels. This is not directly a, a feature to protect guest memory. It's more a, a privilege separation feature in, uh, inside the guest. So with secure nested paging, there are four privilege levels were introduced, VM privilege levels, which are orthogonal to user kernel privilege levels. So you can have um, the, the, the four user kernel privilege levels um, at every four VM privilege levels. Um, each level has its own CPU state, um, and, and there are context switch via the hypervisor. So, when the guest one, wants to change the VMPL it, it's executing on, then it has to make a call to the hypervisor. And it's called privilege levels because um, the hardware can hide certain parts of guest memory from certain privilege levels. So the, the guest can say that certain uh, amounts of memory are only visible or accessible by VMPL0 and not by VMPL1 or VMPL2 or 3. So in this way, um, the, the guest can, or the, 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 soft, the software at VMPL0 can hide memory from any software that's running in, in higher VMPLs. Um, so within, we can use these uh, VM privilege levels to implement an, uh, a secure VM service module, which runs on VP and VMPS zero, and which is um, isolated there and can provide services to, services to the to the guest OS. This of this of course has the implication that the guest OS needs to run on a higher VMPL. Um, and the problem with that is that memory validation is only possible on VMPS zero. So what I uh, talked about before, the PV, the PV date instruction, for example, can only be executed on VMPS0. On higher VMPLs, this will cause an exception. Um, so the guest OS needs to be aware that it's running not in, not in VMPS0. Current um, sec secure nested paging guest code in Linux assumes it's running at VMPS0 um, and tries to do the validation itself, but um, there's additional enablement necessary to make it aware that it does not run on VMPL zero. Yeah, as I said, in basic mode, the OS needs to be aware in which VMPL it runs. Um, and then since the OS needs to defer um, certain tasks to VMPL zero or the SVSM, it, there is also a communication protocol between the OS and the SVSM which works via uh, shared memory pages. So how does the communication flow between the SVSM and the guest OS works? So when the guest OS has a request, it, it, it writes that request to, a, um, to the shared page. There's one sh shared page for each vCPU. Then it calls the hypervisor. The hypervisor will, will switch the guest to VMPS0, which uh, makes the SVSM being executed, the SVSM processes the request and does what the, what the guest OS asked for, either validating memory or, or um, resetting CPUs or whatever it requests. When the SVSM is done, it will call back to the hypervisor and tell it to switch back to VMPL1. The hypervisor does, does that and which is to VMPL1 and um, the guest OS continues to run. Since the hypervisor is uh, involved here and we don't and we actually don't trust the hypervisor, uh, the, the, the communication protocol um, needs to be hardened against hypervisor attacks. So for example, one thing that the SVSM is doing is um, invalidating the CPU states. Uh, of, of, of the guest OS when it, when it is entered so that the hypervisor cannot mal maliciously switch back to the, to the guest OS, it will get an error then. So there's some hardening necessary to avoid this kind of attacks. So the SVSM projects, what does currently exist? Um, currently there are two um, implementations ongoing, uh, both written in Rust. Actually, there is a third one written in C, which was the initial prototype, 
that this is not uh, developed anymore. It was just the initial prototype, which was now ported over to Rust. There is the SVSM project, which I started, which is currently internal. Um, in SUSE, you can find it at, at this um, GitLab uh, URL. And there's the Linux SVSM project from, from AMD. Um, actually, my SVSM project started earlier, but the Linux SVSM progressed better. Um, the reason is that uh, my SVSM uh, has more boilerplate code um, implemented already than Linux SVSM, but Linux SVSM has more features. It can actually handle the request and boot a full Linux guest, which my, which my SVSM cannot do yet. Um, in this talk, I will mostly focus on, on my SVSM. So what is the current state? Um, I have startup code written in assembly, which sets up um, the execution environment and jumps uh, into the Rust code. There's long mode initialization, CPU initialization, including SCB SMP handling. So this includes um, the GHCB protocol, which is used for hypervisor communication um, and all the Peabody date. Um, instruction calling and, and everything that's implemented. Um, there's exception handling with IST support. Um, IST support is actually important because um, the code needs to detect stack overflows, which is only reliably possible with um, an IST double forward vector. There is a serial output. There is um, memory allocation and page table handling. Um, the SVSM currently uses a, a, a body and a slab allocator. It can read QMU firmware configs um, for um, to to actually get in get information about the environment it is running in. Um, currently, this is used for getting the amount of memory that the virtual machine has and reading out the APIC IDs that are enabled. Um, basic SCPI table parsing. This is this was this is used for reading the um, the APIC IDs, and it has some limited support for variables as data structures, so that the VEC implementation already in the in the code base, which simplifies a lot of things. So let's have a closer look at the SVSM boot process, which is actually uh, unique to this implement uh, to my implementation. The AMD implementation boots differently. So. Um, the picture you see in the bottom is uh, the, the memory layout, the initial memory layout of, of, an, um, of a Linux guest in, in KVM with, uh, with an SVSM. So the SVSM is actually mapped as, a, as an option ROM um, after the um, OVMF BIOS and BOS. Um, and when and, and QEMO was modified to, to detect uh, the SVSM and in this case launch not from the real uh, reset vector, but launch from an uh, instruction offset, which is uh, written into the into the SVSM um, binary, and puts the CPU directly in a 32-bit protected mode, which simplifies a lot of things um, going forward. So when the guest starts executing, um, the, the stage one loader um, is starting. All the stage one, lo one loader is doing is relocating um, code to the first 640k. This code contains the stage two loader and the stage two loader is, is, uh, is already written in Rust. But at this stage, it is already executing Rust code. Um, the code is starting at, 64, at 64k. Everything below 64k is the stack and yeah, everything above is code, data, and heap. Um, the stage two loader actually, uh, when it starts executing, um, gets, the, gets uh, the, the memory information from the firmware config, um, searches a, a suitable memory region, which is usually the last 16 megabytes of uh, guest memory. And when it has found the location, it will validate that memory and relocate the SVSM runtime code there. Then it uh, jumps to the SVSM runtime code and now the um, SVSM runtime is executing, um, initializing uh, all CPUs and um, starting 
and and switching to VMPL1 to um, actually hand over control to to uh, the BIOS in this case or VMF, and yeah, basically continue in the in the boot process. So this is what's implemented now. Um, what are the next steps? As I said, my SVSM did not program is not as far as uh, the MD one. It cannot boot a full operating system yet. Um, what are the missing pieces? SMP. Um, that's actually not very difficult to uh, to implement. More difficult is the request handling. Implement that. Um, need to set up the shared data structures and also um, handle the requests that coming in via via them. Um, these are basically the missing pieces to launch a full-fledged guest up, up, up to the Linux kernel and the command line. And when that is working, which is not that much work anymore, um, is to implement support for custom extensions. And some, something I'm thinking about is um, moving lazy memory validation and interrupt handling into the SVSM. Especially for memory validation, I think this makes a lot of sense. Let me uh, dive a little bit in, into that. There's currently work ongoing to implement support for lazy memory validation in the Linux kernel. So how the, how the current Linux um, secure NASA paging guest code works is that it expects all memory to be pre-validated. So it, it, it expects every page in guest valid state which has uh, the advantage that it does not need to track page states because if our memory is validated and it can just, yeah, there's no need to track which pages are not yet validated. Um, the, the problem is with that is that um, when, we, when we actually want to do lazy memory validation and, and have that tracking data in the Linux kernel, um, we have a lifetime problem with, with the data because this data by, by nature um, has a lifetime of the whole system. So until you shut down the virtual machine. But in between, you can you might want to reboot your, your, your virtual machine. You might update the kernel and reboot it with a new kernel or maybe something crashes and you want to, exec, uh, you want to go into a KXEC kernel. Um, and every time this happens, you need to pass the validation data on to the to the to the next operating system you uh, you are booting. Or even if you jump back to the to the firmware, you need to hand the data back to the firmware. So there is a lifetime problem here of the data and the kernel because the kernel usually has a shorter lifetime than the validation data. As I said, it must be preserved across reboots and KXEC. Um, for the reason I just talked about, it seems more natural that um, the data the validation data is stored in the SVSM. Because the, the, the SVSM has the same lifetime as the virtual machine, you can't reboot the SVSM um, while the virtual machine is still running. It's basically the SVSM uh, runtime lifetime is bound to the, to the virtual machine lifetime. This is currently not, not part of the uh, standardization of the SVSM protocol, but I think it, we should discuss whether this um, should at least be an, an, an optional feature of, of uh, the SVSM. This would also uh, save a lot of complexity from the Linux kernel, by the way. Um, same thing with, with interrupt injection. So SCV, SNP also comes with a feature called res restricted injection, which prevents um, the hypervisor from injecting arbitrary events at, 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 at arbitrary points in time into the guest, especially when, when the guest is not expecting them, for example, injecting an interrupt where interrupts are disabled. Um, so there, there, there comes this feature, which is called secure interrupt uh, injection. When this is enabled, the hypervisor can only inject one event, which is a, a hypervisor um, exception. And the, the hypervisor can inject that at basically every given time. And the guest OS knows that and can be made aware of that, that this is exception can run at, uh, can happen at, at every time and can, can, uh, can protect against that. 
normal interrupt vectors are not protected against that. So um, problem is that implementing this in the Linux kernel um, also requires care when, when reboots and KXA come, come into play because um, how it works is that when, when the H3 exception is injected, there is a shared data structure, basically a, a, a full page where the real event that wants, that should be injected is, is written to by the hypervisor. And this data structure also needs to be preserved across reboots and KXEC, which is the next problem. And also the code to support that is going to be very intrusive because basically every STI and CLI instruction in the kernel needs to be instrumented because we're, because what, what this basically means is that um, interrupt injection or, or interrupt delivery is uh, moved from the hypervisor into the guest. And the guest needs, needs to emulate what the hardware would do on an interrupt injection. So when we um, execute an, an, an STI instruction, we need to check whether there's a pending event. And then we need to manually switch to the interrupt handler of that event. Um, yeah, though, I think it can, um, be made work, but it's going to be very intrusive anyway. Maybe it's better to handle that in the SVSM2 using another feature called, causing the, uh, called the alternate injection feature. Alternate injection um, allows it event injection via, um, via the shared CPU states. So the SVSM has access to the CPU states of higher VMPLs. And in the very same data structure that keeps, that keeps the CPU states of higher VMPLs, um, software running at VMP zero can, can also inject events into higher VMPLs. This still needs hypervisor support because the hypervisor needs, needs to know that events should only be, should only ever be injected at VMP uh, zero. But, um, with alternate injection, we would save this complexity, uh, out of the Linux kernel. Uh, these are two, uh, things I'm currently thinking about whether they make sense. Um, now let's get to the most interesting part, which are the SVSM extensions. As I said, the goal of the SVSM is to implement or to provide TPM services to the OS, to the operating system for measured boot, for disk encryption, and generally for security. Because we actually need a, need a TPM inside the guest to be secure for um, confidential computing because everything outside the guest is not trusted. So if you have as, as of today, a TPM, which is emulated outside the guest, it's not trusted. So we need a TPM inside the guest and the SUSM is the way to implement that or to provide the services to uh, the, the operating system to, to the Linux kernel. And the plan is to support um, this by extensions, which do not run in uh, CPL zero, but in, in CPL three, uh, in VMP zero. So the SUSM needs basic support for um, running user space code. Um, which of course needs some boilerplate code like an uh, elf loader because we need some form of, of binary format. It was certainly a, bit, a little bit too complex for that, but um, we can easily generate elf files. So it makes sense to use elf. Um, we, need, we need a task concept and uh, implement task switches, which is yeah, not the difficult. We need user memory handling, at least in, in a very basic way. We don't need demand paging, but um, at least we need to know which memory regions are valid for the for the for the for the uh, extension process. Um, we need a simple Cisco interface, and this means that we also need to harden the entry code uh, for the Cisco interface. Now, this is um, the plan once we can boot a full uh, guest OS. Um, and the reason for putting the extension at CPL3 is that it, they allow a nice separation between the core SVSM and third party code. Because when we want to add a TPM, we don't write, we don't want to write a full TPM in Rust. And as far as I'm aware, there is no open source implementation of, uh, TP, of software TPM in Rust yet. But there are certain implementations uh, which, are, which use C as a language. For example, the, the Microsoft uh, TPM library. Um, and the idea is to use that to implement a software TPM, which can run in the SVSM context. 
So yeah, but I just said, um, this way we, we can have VTPM, which is written in C and which does not interfere in any significant way with the Rust codebits of the SVSM and with, which is yeah separated and this provides an overall more secure, more secure architecture, I think. So what are the conclusions for the, for the SVSM? Um, with an SVSM, we can implement secure attestation in an SCB SMP guest by putting a, a VTPM into it. It's actually the only way of, or one of the, no, it's not the only way, it's one of two ways to implement a TPM for, for SCB SNP, but it's, um, I think, the, the best way of doing it. Because if the VTPM is running in the same context as, as the guest, this is obviously um, the most trusted thing. Um, and having a, having a TPM is also very important because it's uh, the biggest missing piece towards an attested boot for SCV SNP guests. Without a TPM, we only have um, boot at, uh, launch attestation, which basically only, only attests the initial CPU states and the initial memory image of the guest, but not anything that is loaded, like bootloader or kernel in or anything like that. So, but we want to measure that too. So we need a TPM inside the guest. So this is where the SVSM is going. Um, currently, when, when all of that is done, um, there are also some other ideas for future uh, direction and future developments of what the SVSM could be doing um, beyond this uh, basic tasks. Um, I, I already said that, that with confidential computing or, uh, and, and SCV, um, functionality or the, the general trend is that functionality moves from the guest into, you know, from the hypervisor into the guest um, to, make it, to, to make it actually trusted. And VMPLs are basically the, the tool for that. Yeah, we can implement hypervisor functionality inside the guest and minimize the guest host interface this way and implement or move toward a, towards an in-guest paravisor. Paravisor is a term coined by, um, by AMD. They came up with this, uh, with this uh, term. It's basically a piece of software which implements hypervisor functionality inside, inside the guest context. Not a full hypervisor, but hypervisor, lots of hypervisor functionality. Um, and we can uh, move on here by using the Reflect VC hardware feature. What is Reflect VC? Reflect VC is um, another feature of SCB SNP. It can be enabled for every VMPL level. Um, it basically means that the VC exceptions, which I talked about, will not be delivered in that VMPL, so they will not actually cause an exception, but they will cause an intercept. They will create a VM exit, and the hypervisor will will we'll get the request that it should hand over the control to a lower BMPL. So basically on a, on a VC exception, control will go to the SVSM. Um, this removes the need for VC handling in, inside, um, inside the operating system and move that into the SVSM and support fully unenlightened guests this way or mostly unenlightened guests this way. Unenlightened guests are guests which have no support for SCV or only very limited support for SCV. For example, Microsoft Windows, um, which has very limited support for running bare metal on SCV SMP, um, it basically has only some, some DM, DMA enlightenments, which are used in, 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 in Asia. Asia already uses a paravisor for SCV SMP. Guests can be mostly unenlightened, and they are, and they only need special handling for um, for DMA accesses. So all, all that Windows or any enlightened unenlightened guest is knowing uh, is that memory is encrypted, uh, or which memory is encrypted and which memory is unencrypted. So um, yeah, that's all the guest needs to know. Everything else is transparent to the operating system. The same, the same protocol that are, that are used by, by Asia or Hyper-V can actually be implemented into an SVSM and make it possible to actually, to actually boot a Windows guest under SCV SNP on, on KVM. And finally, if we um, think this through, um, 
The final next step would be that we can even move device emulation into the SVSM, um, but using the guest host interface to an absolute minimum and supporting fully unenlightened guests. This will, of course, not perform that well because there's always the SVSM step in between, especially for IO and DMA, but um, it's possible to support that for guests that are not um, enlightened in any way, like, yeah, I don't know, the BSDs, for example. Um, or not, or not enlightened yet. So this was my talk about SVSM. I hope you found it interesting. Thank you for listening and I'm here for your questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Jörg. So uh, if viewers has, have questions, just uh, spin up your camera and ask directly or you can write it onto the chat if you don't have microphone or audio setup. Have there been questions in the chat? Only some video troubleshooting, but uh, there are no questions to the door. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have uh, no. Uh, I have a question about just it. I not very familiar with virtualization, but this concept it reminded me slightly the Zen approach when there is the Dome Zero and Dome Use. Where could it be said that the Dome Zero is paravisor as well from the point of view of Zen? Um. No, the SVSM is actually not a DOM zero or anything like that. On it's um, it's more like a like a small kernel that 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 um, is responsible for emulating uh, devices um, for the for, for the operating system. But currently, only the, the goal is to emulate um, security relevant devices like the TPM. But not anything else like Dom Zero is doing. Like uh, Dom Zero in Zen is is um, responsible for all kinds of devices in the system, like um, disk controllers and network cards and everything. So that's not that's not um, part of the SVSM task. So the main parts of the, the main task of the SVSM is handling um, memory validation. Um, CPU state management for higher BMPLs, which is needed for like um, guest reboot and uh, booting CPUs or, or booting secondary CPUs um, and emulating secure devices like TPMs or any other secure device people may, might come up with. So the extension mechanism will allow other devices too. So yeah. So so it's like shared. Uh... Uh, or I mean, some devices uh, will, would be emulated by the uh, service module, and some devices by the hypervisor. In this right. case, right, right. Actually, in the first stage, everything besides the TPM will be emulated by the hypervisor. I see. But in the future, we can we can move more into into the into the guest as we see the need for it. The the, the architecture allows for that. One one issue, for example, with with confidential computing is that we that we need to harden the the device drivers because the device drivers talk to insecure or talk to hypervisor emulated devices, and this is of course untrusted. So, and when your device interface suddenly becomes untrusted, um, most drivers are not actually ready to handle that or, or to handle malicious input from devices. Um, if we have device emulation inside the guest, the device emulation becomes trusted again, and we only need to harden the interface of the in-guest device emulation to the hypervisor. Downside is, downside is of course, that this is, does not perform very well, but um, or likely not perform very well. But um, yeah, these are the things to think about. Yeah, so there is still uh, lots of work to do, I see. Uh, 
So if there are any last questions, now's the opportunity. Uh, I think there are no more questions. Yeah, so thank you, Jörg. Uh, yeah. um, one last word. Um, if, if anyone is interested in, in, in joining the project and helping out with development, just uh, contact me and let me know, and um, we can need help everywhere, basically. Okay, so I if you ever, ever wanted to write a kernel in Rust, then this is your chance. <laughs>